my name is Jason Strait. I'm here today to talk to you about, uh, within our data lifecycle optimization series, uh, big data and predictive analytics. Uh, as, as I mentioned, uh, my name is, let's see if this will actually yeah, progress. There we go. Come on, go one more slide. There we go. My name is Jason Strait. Uh, if you have any questions throughout this, uh, please type them into the chat window, and we'll get to as many of those at the end as, as we can. I'm hoping that we can get to um, if most, if not all. Uh, I do uh, have been working with SQL Server and big data topics for for a number of years here now, and uh, that's basically what we're going to talk about today. So what we're what we're looking at here is big data and predictive analytics. And as much as I've been a DBA for most of my career, I actually started my career with predictive analytics. And this was uh, about 15 years ago. I was working at a bank. Uh, we were working with an access database trying to find merchant card vendors. So not, not, not people that had credit cards, but people that processed credit cards. We were looking at trying to find merchants that were trying to steal money from the bank. And basically what they would do is run, fraudulently run credit cards through their systems and then take the money and run. Now this is long before I knew anything about data warehousing, long before I really knew what a DBA was supposed to do, uh, but what we were doing is we were taking SAS data models and the calculations and the weightings that would come through there and push that stuff together. And ever since I worked on that project, I've been waiting for the day where we could really start doing this again in SQL Server, where we didn't have to bring in a lot of PhDs and um, use tools like SAS that made it difficult to get in there. Because licensing for SAS and the, that bar for entry was, is, is always a challenge for a lot of organizations because of costs. And so what we're going to talk today about is how the changes in the environments and the changes on what we can do with data today has really enabled us to really move forward and be able to bring analytics and big data into our data platforms. So I'm going to start off by take, talking a little bit today about our data lifecycle optimization. This webinar is a part of that series of webinars. It's a process that we use internally at at Pragmatic Works, and then we're going to talk about what big data and predictive solutions are, how you can build some success about, around them, how you can then approach an initiative, and then going through ensuring success and getting some help on the platform. And so, let's just get started with talking about data lifecycle optimization. Uh, data lifecycle optimization is a process that we use in Pragmatic Works that basically bridges the gap, the the maturity. Or, or the gap in maturity between the different areas that you're going to want to use data in. Now, in most organizations, and many of them that, that I've interacted with in the past, a lot of times that systems are built over time. And sometimes you'll make, um, you'll take shortcuts, you'll pull things together just to get it to work. And as time goes on, you get to a point where things are a bit of a mess. And this happens in data platforms, this happens in interstates, interstates all the time. Uh, we've got an interstate section that used to be called Spaghetti Junction that's near where I live. And at, at some point they decided, you know, we need to fix this Spaghetti Junction. And at some point organizations start to look at it, that they need to change and fix how everything is pulled apart, um, all tangled up, and get it to a system where you, the data or the traffic can flow very well throughout the system. And that's basically what we look at when we're looking at data lifecycle optimization. It's things that people are all oops, are all familiar with. Architecture, availability, performance and optimization, enterprise BI, you know, all those core basic steps that lead into getting to big data and being able to build predictive analytics on top of that. And that's what we do, whoops, there with it. And the, the basic idea behind big data and, I mean, be, behind the data lifecycle optimization is that ability to build upon the previous work that you've done. And so as you build it up, you get to a point where you can start to do stuff and do work with, with the data that you've been collecting and build some predictive analytics on top of that. 
And so when we talk about big data, uh, what big data is, and I want to talk a little bit just about what big data is before we talk about some of the solutions, is it's, it's not necessarily that it's a lot of data. It's basically the idea that you're getting data from lots of different sources today. And you need to be able to do stuff with that to be able to build some operational optimizations so that you can act on the data that you're getting. All of our machines, all of our websites are generating data. Our applications are constantly generating data. We've got data that's coming in all the time. And it's the idea of being able to respond to that data when and where you need to in order to provide some value from it. And it's also talking about how the culture within many organizations is shifting as people are going from getting to a point where they understand that one of the core currencies that you have within your organization is the data that you generate. You know, if you look at what websites like Amazon.com do, where they take the order that you place and then use it to further help other people in the future figure out, hey, if I buy X, maybe I might want to buy Y. That whole market ba basket analysis, all of those things are, a lot, are, are, are we're capable of doing now because of what we're doing with the ability to pull out all the noise from the data that's coming through and do some analytics on top of that to predict what people are going to want to purchase. And when you look at it, what we've looked at and what we've done a lot in the last few years, or in the last you know 10 something years, is a lot of the focus has been on business intelligence. Business intelligence is a great starting point for building out larger analytics and actionable systems because it can take the, the data that you have, or in this case, this big log that you have, and start pulling it, pull, pulling it apart. And the interesting thing, interesting thing about all of this is they're not necessarily the same, but they're really tied into each other. So big data is going to be the ability to pull all that data together and distill some information out of it. And business intelligence is taking that information that you can maybe distill out of it and being able to then readdress the data that, that, that you're looking at. A really good example of this is a company that I was working for, what they were doing is they were sending out emails to all of their customers. And every time that those emails would come back, some people would respond, some people wouldn't respond. They would have images in the emails so they could understand if the person even opened up the email. And what they started to be able to get was this log of activity that would tell them, hey, this is all the, the, the information that we know about you, and these are the things that people were that people would look at, these are the pieces of email and the types of emails that people would actually purchase on. And when you start to take that, that information all together, well, now you've got some big data. You've got some data that doesn't necessarily tell you anything yet, but if you start to distill that, run some predictive analytics on top of that, you can add on to your business intelligence systems or your filtering systems that you use for generating all those lists to start to understand the probability that in the next set of emails that you send out, what kind of, what kind of response rate you're going to get. Now to get to all of these, there's a whole big data ecosystem. There's a lot of ways that you can address big data because often some of the times that you have well, often some of the problems that you have when you're dealing with big data is the capabilities for existing platforms to be able to support it. And so when people generally talk about big data, they're talking about Hadoop platforms. Now, you can support big data solutions on appliance-type solutions such as a Microsoft's Analytics Platform System, which is an MPP scale-out SQL Server solution. But primarily what people are looking at when they're looking at big data is things like the HDFS, so the Hadoop file system. MapReduce to pull things together. HCatalog on top of that to have metadata on, on there so you can do things like build out HBase for your non-relational databases. And then pigs so that you can script out your data and hives so that you can treat some of the SQL Server, well not SQL Server, but you can treat some of the data that underlies that system like it is within 
a SQL Server or relational database. And part of all of these is the idea to build out systems to deal with all of those, those solutions, to be able to distribute out the workloads so that you can process all of that data. And that leads into other components and other pieces that are out there because after you're able to store the data, you need to start processing the data so that you start seeing things like Storm or Flume for processing data and doing event-driven data processing. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that one of the things that I've worked on in the past was a solution that leveraged SPSS. So as part of all of the big data pieces that are out there, there is that need to be able to start leveraging data science and building predictive analytics on top of that. And there's anal lots of analytics products that are out there. There's SPSS, there's R, there's SAS. Um, I talked to a gentleman just this past week who's been using Python for doing his uh, predictive analytics. Along with this, though, there is now also, and for some reason I don't have a logo for it here, but there's also Azure Machine Learning. So when you're working through and generating these, these predictive analytics and trying to forecast and make predictions, you have a suite of tools that are available. Now, of course, once you pull these all together, some of the things that you're gonna be looking at is how do I consume all of this? And there's lots of pieces that you can use for consuming all of these. Um, you know, a lot of these people should already know, Tableau, Power BI, ClickView, the thing about what's changed when it comes to big data solutions today is that things are beginning to be, with all of these tools, SPSS, with Tableau, with Hadoop, you're now able to start to consume the big data a lot easier. It's, it's not requiring that top 1% of technologists to be able to deliver these solutions. It's starting to get to, actually it's not starting to, it's actually at the point where virtually anyone that has the need and the desire can start to delivering on big data solutions. And part of that enablement comes from the ability to deploy your big data solutions to the cloud. Because you can start to build out your topologies exactly as you see fit without having to be tightly tuned into a hardware scenario. One of the challenges in the past when dealing and building out big data solutions is the fact that <coughs> if you needed to build up a 60 node Hadoop cluster, you needed 60 something servers. Well now, to build up a 60 node Hadoop cluster, you need an account on one of the cloud platforms. And it gives you that ability to start building out your solutions in a way that accommodates all of your best practices, gets all of the pieces that you need there, and be able to easily scale up and down your solutions. And what that gives you is the ability to start looking at things that you want to do and what you want to do within your, your, your solutions suites. Because you, know, you don't necessarily want to go and start doing things that are, you don't want to necessarily, you're going to do data mining, but you don't necessarily want to get up in the morning and say that you're going to do data mining. What you really want to do is start looking at what's going on out there and finding out interesting things about your platforms. Now in the list of this, this awesome things, we've got Formula One, which has analytics within each one of the cars to help tune the cars as they're driving so that the next time it shows up in the pit, they know exactly what needs to be changed on it based upon how it's been running for the last few laps. One really good scenario that I have that I talked with a customer just recently with is the ability to use sentiment. And interestingly enough, nobody here was is actually interested in sentiment. Um, and I think one of the reasons why people aren't too interested in sentiment is that it's hard to figure out what do you do? You know, somebody's talking nicely about your products or they're talking poorly about your products, well, what do you do next? Or is even, the, you know, the guy that's yelling at the, on the street corner about your product on Twitter, you know, is he actually doing, you know, any good or harm to your, 
to, to, your, to your product. But here's the thing to think about. If you can find, a, find out how people feel on, on one of the social platforms, in this case we'll conti con continue to use Twitter, if you can figure out how a person feels about your platform, generally by their tweets, and then you can tie that information back into, or that user, back into a person that you're making sales to, now you can start doing some interesting analytics across who are the people that like your products, how much do they spend, who are the people that they influence. A customer that I talked to actually found that one of, the, one of their top purchasing customers was also the person that talked most negatively about their product online. That's definitely a, uh, an issue that you want to be able to find. And big data and predictive analytics gives you that ability to go and discover that kind of information. And it's not even that challenging to do it anymore. And so that's kind of the, the interesting things that you can do with predictive and big data solutions. You know, that analytics that we did when I worked for a merchant card company, you know, being able to discover when a company was going to potentially steal money was kind of a big deal. And interestingly enough, the experience that I had from going all that is I know that if somebody tells me that they're going to, and this is based upon you know, some of the customers that we worked, at, worked with back at that time, you know, I know that if somebody was going to tell me that they're going to sell golf clubs over the internet, I know that that's a high risk business because I know how much money those guys used to steal. And if you ever go and buy golf clubs, don't buy them over the internet. The other thing that's, that is interesting from the experience I had there with all the predictive analytics is, you know, back 17 years ago when I was working on this stuff, we actually discovered the 9.95 a month charge fraud that comes out of some of the, the, the Russian criminal groups. Now, this is something that's made it into the news. It's, it's been around. People have talked about it. Um, not 15 years ago, not 17 years ago, but something that people have been talking about um, in the last five, six years. But it's something that's been around for a really long time. And I discovered it way back when because of the analytics that we were doing on the platforms and, and, and the amount of money that they were taking. So how do you go about, you know, knowing the things that you can do with big data and, and predictive analytics, how do you go about taking that and building some success with it? And to do that, it's really about getting the data. It's about having the data available so that you can do that predictive, anal predictive an anal analytics. One of the biggest challenges that people that are doing predictive analytics have is getting the data. They have a, a, they have a ton of tools. And actually, when I've talked to people that do predictive, predictive analytics, they generally say, yeah, I've got everything I need. Uh, you know, one tool from another tool, it's, it's basically, you know, what is the tool that I want to use today? The biggest problem is getting that data and having the data available. And that's where you're going to want to take and make sure that you have your data laid out in a way that is just not garbage. Now, oftentimes when people talk about big data, they're like, you know, give me everything you got and I'm going to make something useful out of it. Well, it's only kind of like that. You can give people everything you got, but you need to have a little bit of control and an order on top of that data. Not a ton, but you need to know a little bit about it. And part of being able to get to the point where you know something about the data and you have some order on the data is that DLO process that I talked about at the beginning. If you've got your environment to a point where you can that you know that you have a really good architecture and, and you've got everything configured proper, properly, you've got some business intelligence that's already being built into the system, that's going to give you the ability to move forward with, with big data and have trust in the data that you're collating. And that's, an, that's a, a really important part of building out your platforms. And so as you're looking at building success, Make sure that you're laying out that foundation that gives you the ability to build big data 
and um, predictive analytic solutions on data that you can trust. Now, the data doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be data that you can trust. Because if you look at what comes in, so through, say, you know, say you're going to take something like PerfMont, and you're going to do a big data solution on that. And so you take all your service throughout your entire environment and start bringing in all of that data. What you need to be able to do is trust that a value that comes through for, say, CPU utilization is actually that value. But you don't need to actually have every single value. And actually, you can miss a lot of the values for CPU percent utilization and still get good analytics on top of it. So that's the, the piece I'm talking about there. You need to be able to trust your data because you understand it, because you've built out a platform that gives you that ability to trust. But you don't necessarily have to have every single sampling. And actually, if you look at how any platform that does any um, performance monitoring works, it doesn't get give you every sampling. And usually, I mean, just to start with, usually it's every 15 seconds. And typically, lots of those values get pulled out right away. So you have even, even fewer that you're actually looking at. Now, when you're building out any sort of a big data solution, you're going to want to fig take, take an approach to figure out, you know, how are we going to actually get this built out? And the way that we approach it is we look at it from the perspective of building blocks. The reason why I want to look at it from building blocks is there's a lot of ways that you can build up your different solutions. And the things that are tied into any big data solution, they're changing constantly. Six months ago, nobody talked about Storm. Now, Storm is, is a uh, data transformation process. Well, it's a streaming data transformation engine that can be used for Hadoop to move data from one place to another. You can put a spout on your data source, tie in there, tie in there with, with Storm, pull it across, land the data. It's fully transformed, ready to go. It's just like magic. Now, six months ago, not a lot of talk about Storm. Three months ago, people were talking about it a bit. And now, today, there are ways that you can interact with Storm as a service on, on, um, uh, on the Azure platform. And so things are changing. Tools that didn't exist are going to be there. And so as you start looking at this, one of the ways that you want to do this as you're approaching how do you do big data is take a look at how you can deploy this into the cloud. Whether you're going to use the Azure cloud, whether you're going to use Google, whether you're going to use Amazon, look at how you can pull this all together. Because the elasticity of cloud-based architectures gives you that ability that you can build out your solutions. And so you may have a data site that you need to address with six nodes within Hadoop. And the next time you need to address it, maybe the data is doubled. And so now you need to have 12 nodes. The elasticity of the cloud allows you to easily build that up and down. Now, I have a preference for looking at Azure for building out cloud-based solutions. Um, you folks can you know, look at which, whichever you prefer. Um, I would encourage you to look at Azure because l looking at Azure and the cloud in general gives you a lot of ways that you can address these, these solutions. So I said it's about building blocks. So within the Azure cloud, specifically, you can deploy Hadoop. Now, there's a lot of ways that you can deploy Hadoop within Azure right now that make it very simple to deploy. The first is you can just do HD Insight. Um, HD Insight is a Windows-based version of Hadoop that within the Azure platform, it's basically wizards that you can run through to do a full Azure deployment. Um, you can also use PowerShell to do a full um, Azure deployment for Hadoop. On top of that, you can also do Hortonworks, and you can also do Cloudera. Now, HD Insight is Hortonworks on Windows. Uh, the Hortonworks that you can deploy out there as well is the Linux one. So, you know, depending upon what it is that you need to get out of um, 
your, your Hadoop platform, the tools that you need to enable, the ecosystem that you want to tap into, all of that is supported and you can just start building it out today. All you need is an Azure account and start building that. The next thing that you're going to want to look at is, you know, what are you going to do for predictive analytics? I mentioned earlier that one of the big problems that a lot of folks that are doing predictive analytics run into is that they need to be able to get the data. Now when we're collating our big data systems, it's really about being able to pull it all together so that they can have that data. But if they can have that data, where is it going to be? Well, within the Azure Cloud, you have the ability to put the data into SQL databases, into Hadoop, into um, Azure Storage, and then at that point, you know, take your predictive analytics tool to pull that data out. Now, out of the tools that are available, the one that I would, I would take a look at is machine learning. Uh, the reason to take a look at machine learning is th there's, there's a couple of reasons. One is that machine learning can tap into any of those data sources that I mentioned natively from the cloud. And so you don't have to do additional extra processing. You know, get the data into Azure Storage, connect into it. Put it into a SQL database, connect into it. At that point, you can run your machine, your machine learning or your predictive analytics on top of that in with it, whichever fashion that you want. You can use some of the built-in um, data mining tools, you can use in some of the built-in um, models, or if you have a R module, you can bring that in. Or as somebody pointed out to me actually earlier this week, if you've built out um, Python scripts for doing your machine learning, I mean for doing your predictive analytics, you can bring that in as well. And I mean personally, I didn't even know that you could do predictive analytics with Python, but apparently you can, and um, a gentleman I talked to just this week was working on that. Now on top of that, you've got sometimes with big data the, uh, the need to go through documents. Um, this is often done with uh, tools such as MongoDB, or if you're up in the Azure cloud, you can use DocumentDB document to store and parse through those documents and do your text, textual analysis. And to tie this all together, we have Azure Data Factory. Azure Data Factory is a tool that's in preview right now, but it's basically an ETL tool in the cloud that enables you to tie all of these pieces together to transform and move data within there. And so you can build out your big data solutions up in the cloud, and you have all these components, these building blocks that you can use for pulling everything together. Now, as you're looking at these solutions, and I'm hopefully giving you guys ideas on the things that you can do and how you can enable yourself to move forward. Um, unfortunately, with a webinar like this and a vast topic such as big data and predictive analytics, um, there's not a lot of time for digging deep into any one area. But before we get to the end, I want to talk about ensuring the success of any project that you start to work on. Because we've talked a little bit about technology here, and oftentimes when I see people do, and this is actually something that I first saw when somebody introduced XML into SQL Server, is you'll go, oh, well, I could use Hadoop, so I'm going to use Hadoop. Ah, cool, Storm's out there, I'm going to use that too. That's the wrong approach. Uh, that's, that's really similar to what a guy said to me when XML was first introduced into SQL Server. He goes, SQL Server supports XML, that's great. Um, all my call tables are now going to have one column, and I'll just put XML documents in there with all of the data, and then we can just do all the joins after that. It'll be perfect, it'll be great. This is the best database ever. That really doesn't work. And the reason why it doesn't work is you're using technology to drive a solution. And un unfortunately, when it comes to business that funds your paychecks, that funds your work, that funds the business itself, they want to be able to enable their systems to do business things, not technology things. And so what you really want to be doing is looking at, instead, is what is that business solution that you're looking at? What is it 
that you can provide to the business side using big data solutions, using predictive analytics that can make things easier, make things run better. That ability to go through and say, hey, I want to find the people that are going to steal money. Now, when you look at when you look at areas like that, it's not always going to be obvious. One of the interesting things about the model that we put together for merchant fraud, um, and this is way back when, so I'm pretty sure that the models have, have evolved since then. Um, in our V2 of the model, one of the things that they had in there was we need a, um, we would score merchants that had been customers for more than 30 days and had never made a, de never made a deposit. So that was one of the, the um, attributes. Second attribute was I want to find customers that have been, that have done large deposits in the last seven days. Totally different types of attributes there that didn't really lead into one into the other. They're kind of opposites. But in the model that got created, they actually had a correlation between the two of them. They would find two different types of potentially fraudulent customers. And so those are the things that you're going to want to look at. You know, what is it that you're enabling the business to be able to do? And let's use our building blocks, build out a cloud solution to be able to pull this all together. Now, as you're looking at this and getting going, though, you're going to want to figure out exactly, so if you, you solve a question or you have a problem, you have a business problem that you need to solve, you know, what type of project do you want to throw at this? And when it comes to things like predictive analytics, this is actually one of those areas where you want to be sure that you're doing it and addressing it the, uh, from the right perspective. And, and the reason why I say this is when you talk about things like proof of concepts, when you talk about pilots, when you talk about prototypes, in, in some cases people think that these are the exact same thing. But, but really they're not. A proof of concept is basically the idea of, hey, I've got this idea, let's see if I could do something with it. It's just idea validation. A pilot is you know, taking that idea and seeing if you can build a solution around it. Not a full solution, but something that's useful. Prototype is really the idea of, I want to build a full functioning solution around this idea that we validated out. And so they each lead into one and another. And so as you're looking at building out any of these different um, processes, look at what you, what you want to be able to do from the perspective of what is it that you enable with the business by doing each specific type of project. In many cases, you're going to want to actually build a prototype out. Because if you build a proof of concept out, and the proof of concept might be, can we take all of these files and put them into some sort of big data solution? From a proof of concept perspective, perspective that's a fairly useless project. Um, because in general, yeah, you can. It's just a matter of moving them around the files. Um, that's, that's not really an idea that's worth validating. Predictive analytics. Is there value in doing a proof of concept on, pre on predictive analytics around the idea of, you know, does Azure ML work? Well, that is probably a question that you could just answer with a few white papers, because Azure ML does work. The question is going to really be, does it work for the scenarios that you want to use it for? And so what you're going to want to do is find what is that reason, what does that business need in case, and build out a pilot or a prototype around it. So when you're getting started or, and, and you want to ensure the success of your project and ensure that you're able to move forward, look at that. Look at what the business case is. What, look at what the business need is and move from there. Now, to, to wrap up here today, uh, the, la the last thing that, we, that I wanted to talk about is, is talk about getting help. 
so part of this series is introducing people to the idea of our, our DLO, our data lifecycle optimization. It's not necessarily, hey, come and have us get, go and do that for you. It is basically the idea that the data lifecycle optimization actually is a way that, for, for me, when I first started working with it, it really kind of helped connect the dots. It showed that need to have a good foundation for our BI architectures. It showed that need to have a good BI architecture in order to lead into our big data solutions. And so when you're looking at moving into big data and um, predictive analytics, you're going to want to start with an inventory of your skills. What is it that you guys are good at? What are the things that you have skills on? And, and work to so that people are able to know what they're doing or need to learn. And then from um, obviously, um, I would I would recommend talking talking to somebody like myself and and and, and finding a mentor in that capacity. Of started with um, work on B. Uh, I've mentioned a few of the projects that I've helped work on. There's a number of um, others I've worked on within with my group. Uh, what you are going to find out there when you find a mentor is the people that are experts with these these solutions already have done some interesting things. I know of a gentleman who was working on some big data solutions, so it's basically doing some inventorying of videos and wanted to do some keyword tagging up, sorry, pulling the videos apart slide by slide, or I should say frame by frame, pull the videos apart, and then did some OCR to find all the text, used all that text that was generated to tag all the videos so that he knew what the content was from um, for each one of those videos. You know, there are people that are out there that are doing interesting things, and it's always a value to find some mentors that can help you on that. So hopefully uh, this session has been useful for people. If you do have questions on big data and predictive analytics, uh, please just drop them down into the chat window. If you want to chat offline or have a further discussion, um, I've got my information up on the screen there. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today. And do we have any questions? Uh, we actually do have some questions. Uh, there's so many different NOS SQL DBS out there. What is the criteria in choosing the right NoSQL DB for our data? So that's way more challenging of a question than, than it seems on the face. So when you're, when you're looking at NoSQL databases, whether it's um, Couch or Mongo or, or any of the ones that are out there, it's, it's really about what is the specific use case that you need to solve. And so um, if you've got some specific use cases that, that you're looking at, uh, we can do some recommendations based upon that. Uh, that's probably a little bit more text than would fit into the chat window that we could really adequately answer. So if you want to just send me an email, my email is up on the screen right now. Um, I can give you some suggestions based upon uh, your scenario. Uh, same person asked, we'd like to start a pilot or proof of concept project and reached out to business side to identify a use case, but users have no clue what to get out of the non-structured data or what specific business questions to ask or benefits to get, how to guide them to identify a good use case. Uh, so for identifying a good use case, what I would just start with is what is what is you know? I look at the type of data that you have that you're that you're working with, and start to envision what it is that they do with the data. So if you've got users that need to, a very good example. When I first started off, I mentioned I started off in a fraud department. Um, you know, it was started as an access database. Um, it was previously a mainframe database. We got these reports. We got these lists that had all this work that we had to do and we were expected to go through there and find everyone that was going to steal money every day. And generally, for, there's six people, well, there's six people, there's generally 30,000 records we had to go through daily. They threw everything away, and then we started over. 
terrible, terrible process. At one point, somebody had the idea of, well, what if we could just score these? So look at what your business is doing, and look at, from a predictive analytics perspective, what would change if you scored your customers? What would change if you scored your, um, you know, some of the statistics that you have? What would happen if you looked at your sales process, and in the sales process, say that you do a quote, and then from the quote, you go through and um, do a follow-up, and then at, at some point in the, down the pipeline, you do your sale. Well, what if, instead of doing that process, you had a way that, through predictive analytics, you could say, well, if a person's going to buy X, Y, and Z, based upon previous people that have bought X, Y, and Z, at the point which they do the quote, we should try and make close the sale because they're more, more likely to close that sale. So those are the kind of things that you're going you, you're to want to be looking at. What is the process? What is the gaps in the process that are not leading to success? And how can you provide some value on top of that that can either remove steps by achieving success earlier or identify what it is that they're trying to look for. Anytime somebody's getting a document that's got thousands of lines, you know, what are the ways that you could make that into three lines? Um, and predictive analytics may be the way that you do that. Or if it's being sorted by dollar value. Is dollar value really what you care about? Or is it the person that's most likely to do something and that dollar value is the risk? And that's what you want to be looking at. Okay. Our company hopefully is... That's useful. Okay, our company, wait, that's, uh, nope, different question. Our company is looking into hiring a data scientist to do predictive modeling. What basic skill set do you think the candidate should have? SAS, SPSS, slash R, Hadoop, HDFS, Hive, Pig, Mayhout. Should the person be mainly statistician or IT programmer or both? Ah, that's an interesting question. Actually, actually, and, and actually it's a good question. Um, somebody with an IT background is going to be useful um, because with the ways in which everything is changing, um, the ability to do some coding is going to be useful. And the reason why that's going to be useful is because with R, is, R is a scripting language. Um, SAS and SPSS are great tools. Uh, what I've generally found, though, is the people that use those are very um, focused on that tool, and they don't necessarily know how to connect that tool into other platforms. Um, because all they really care about is um, you know, the, the data that's in there. Somebody that's a, that's a statistician is going to be exceptionally useful. Um, so you're going to want to look for somebody who's got a bit of a scripting background, a statistician, um, that they know how to use R. I would also be looking at, you know, somebody that understands building out um, or leveraging cloud in, in some of those capabilities. And and basically from that, I would be looking at some at uh, somebody who's willing to look at um, either either Azure ML or whatever, because um, I'm I'm sure some of the other third party vendors for for cloud solutions have their versions of of um, uh, cloud analytics, but something that can you do use a cloud analytics solution. Okay, how can I get access to Data Factory? Ah, Data Factory, um, it is in public preview right now. So if you have an Azure account, uh, you should be able to sign up for that preview. All right, and Tim Cash has sent you a message that says, not a question, but thanks, Jason. Awesome presentation. Oh, positive sentiment analysis from a current customer of the big picture with credible analytics background in Jason, business use cases, and where you need to be in the life cycle to effectively do big data and analytics. So a little Hello. kudos for you. Thank you. <laughs> Regarding getting help, do you have a mentor who specializes in IBM Big Data Solution? Um, I'm not sure if we have someone internal right now that I, or someone that I know. 
um, if you reach out to me via email, um, I know that we've we've got a couple of guys that are uh, they're actually going and getting their data science master's degree right now, um, and they may know somebody specific that we can connect you with. Okay. Will the slides in this webinar be available to review offline? I can answer the question about the webinar, but you may have to answer the question about the slides. The webinar will be available by Friday on our website. Yep, and I'll have the slides up later on Friday. Um, after I get uh, connected to the webinar, I'll put it, post it up on my blog. All right. Did you know about the Splice machine as Hadoop RDBMS? Uh, that piece I don't know about. We are looking. Uh, sorry. Uh, that that piece is new for me, but I mean, there's there's always something new coming out, so I'm not surprised that there's something I haven't heard about. Okay, we are looking at replacing a text mining tool. Would that make a good candidate for POC or pilot? Absolutely, I would look at. Um, if, if you're doing something that's going to be text mining to get enough information, uh, you're probably going to be looking at um, doing some sort of a pilot. Um, with, a, with a proof of concept, generally with that success criteria, you're going to be uh, baking off between a couple of, of different platforms. But if you've got something and you're trying to just build out something new on top of that, I would look at a pilot. Uh, proof of concepts usually are pretty short. Uh, pilots usually give you enough information that you can really go forward. Okay, he also further says it's for reviewing customer comments or issues. Mm. Yeah, you may even want to look at um, Azure ML because they've got some capabilities within there for doing text mining. All right, last question. When doing predictive analysis, is there a general rule of thumb on the length of historical data you should look at? Not generally, so, and, and I don't mean that because there isn't one. The, the thing that you're going to look at with any model that you do for predictive analytics is that it is not ever done. Um, you'll, you'll generate the model, you'll get it built out, you'll get it trained, you'll get it validated, and you'll start running some data through it. As you run more data through it, you're going to want to tune it again. Um, as I mentioned, when I was talking about the model that we worked on, the, the one that I pointed out some of the characteristics for, that was our version two of the model. Uh, we basically got into a stride where we were building out new models every three months. So we did it on a quarterly basis because, you know, from, from a calculation perspective, we just had to tweak out the calculations. From a system perspective, as we got better at finding the customers that were going to um, cost us money, uh, customers got better at finding new ways to get into the system. So well, to steal money, so we, you know, we were always tweaking it, and so we were always throwing more data at it and tuning it along that way, so there isn't like a good um, max on how much you want to throw at it, uh, but you definitely you want to throw enough data at it that you get at least a model that gets started, uh, but you don't want to throw so much data at it that it's going to take days and weeks to process. You know, build out a model that just takes maybe a day to process with, with the amount of data that you throw at it because you'll probably do, before you even get the first version of it, you'll probably do multiple iterations on it. And you definitely don't want to make it a two, three month process just to get your first model.